All right. Well, let's get started by opening up in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning and for this opportunity to make a study of a historical book uh, from one of your servants. But Lord, we trust that as you guide the affairs of the church, as you protect the unity of the church through your, tr- through your truth and through the gifts that you have given to the church, among whom are pastors and teachers, we pray that this would be profitable for us. It would not be an end in itself, simply a neat set of facts about modern history, but that it would be profitable to us, that we would see patterns so as to be discerning about the enemy's lies, and so as to be uh, more excellent ourselves in being able to, to chart out your truth, to express it better for others, to be better teachers ourselves. So Lord, we pray that this whole class would be an honor to you and would build up your saints, whoever does view it, and beginning with those of us here who are able to think about these things. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to start this class on Christianity and liberalism that examines J. Gresham Machen's book. Um, Next year is the the 100th anniversary of the book, and I just wanted to beat everybody else to it. I I, I figure people are going to have classes and studies and so on, conferences maybe even, who knows, because it was an important book and really one of the most underrated books on theology in the modern era that I think every Christian should read at one point or another. But I want to start by turning in your Bibles to two passages for our reflection, Uh, Jude 3 and 4 and Titus 1 verse 9, and you could read Titus 1, 9 through 11. But these sections, really all of Paul's letters, but these sections in particular give us a mandate. And you can think of them as a pastoral mandate, something for elders to do, but really it's something that all church members should at least be aware of. And that is the mandate to what is sometimes called polemics. In other words, the art of, maybe even the science of, argumentation. So polemical theology would be, it sounds bad, argumentative theology. But really it just means that task of protecting the flock and protecting the integrity of doctrine. So Jude, in Jude 3 and 4, he opens off the letter almost as if to say, hey, I wanted to write to you about all these things we have in common and all this, but here's what he, he interrupts his flow of thought in the introduction, and he says in verse 3, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. And then turn over to Titus, where Paul is writing to Titus, and he's talking about elder qualifications. And he says this in verse 9 about overseers, that he must hold firm the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Now, following that, he gives his reason for it. You have these wolves One of the things he says is that they had to be silenced because they are upsetting whole families. So in other words, now if somebody says, now hold on, now the pastoral ministry, Christian ministry in general, even the teaching office is a whole lot more than arguing and putting heretics in their place. That's true, it is is more than that. But it's never less than that. And that's what Machen exemplified perhaps better than anybody in the last century or so. What he stood for and what he stood against matters for us today. And the classic work that stands at the heart of that, what is called the, you'll hear me refer to the fundamentalist modernist controversy, or simply the modernist controversy. And we'll talk about what that is as we go. But the debate hasn't really changed. Some of the outer externals of it, some of the flavor of it has, but if you kind of go under the packaging, you'll recognize a lot of the things that we're going to talk about in the church today. And you won't just recognize it as liberalism out there or as some kind of a relic in the Museum of Historical Theology or church history, but you'll recognize it in conservative churches creeping in. That's where it creeps in. It doesn't have to creep into the liberal church. That church is already liberal. It creeps into the conservative 
church. Well, let's do a little biography first. So here's kind of where we're going. We're going to look really at two things after what we just read. Some biographical material of Machen, and then get into the thesis and the structure of Christianity and liberalism, and then we'll get on to chapter 1, and we'll summarize it each week, each chapter. But just some introductory material. First, some biography. Now, that's small. Don't worry about it. We'll have bigger stuff. Uh, I should have put it on two slides. I never learn. But uh, there's basically a timeline of what I would regard to be the, the bigger events in Machen's life. His dates are 1881 to 1937. He had uh, a prominent Baltimore attorney for a father and a, a daughter of wealthy Georgians, an author herself um, as a mother. So really, both the parents were authors. And Machen was raised from an early age to be a reader, to be a thinker, to be a mover and a shaker in society. In fact, they, they had friends who were the movers and shakers of society. We'll run into one of them that you'll recognize later on. He would study at Johns Hopkins University in order to stay at home. And then he, he I don't have this on the timeline, but he briefly transferred to the University of Chicago where he studied things like economics and even banking. I mean, here's a guy who had a wide variety of interests, but his real passion was the classics. In other words, the Greek classics, not just New Testament, but really anything you can get his hands on from the classical world. And so he went back home to Princeton to study philosophy and theology. At this point, he had no thoughts of the ministry. He didn't think he was, you know, um, spiritually inclined enough to do that at this point. But at Princeton at the time, you had these theological giants that would be influential on Machen first as a student. Uh, B.B. Warfield and Gerhardus Voss reigned in the halls of that institution, and these are sort of household words in the modern Reformed tradition. Warfield was the great champion of Reformed orthodoxy. He sort of took the baton from the Hodges, Charles Hodge and his son Alexander Archibald, who only got to teach there briefly, so Warfield kind of took that uh, he, he was the link there, really a link that it stretches as far back as Jonathan Edwards, starting Princeton. Of course, Edwards only survived the couple weeks, if you know that story. But Princeton, unlike Harvard and Yale, Harvard and Yale were also started as Puritan seminaries. The whole goal was to raise up ministers and so on. Well, that didn't last very long. You know, uh, Harvard was sacked as early as 1701, where Increase Mather was booted and a bunch of uh, wealthy Anglicans, yes, I'll take that opportunity to pick on the Anglicans, because that because these were a bunch of deists and universalists who were taking over that college and turning it into what we know as a secular university. And Yale was sacked pretty much right away when Edwards was studying there uh, during the 1720s or teens. And um, Princeton survived throughout the 19th century. Princeton was known as the great bastion of Reformed orthodoxy in America. And so, into the 20th century, even, you had guys like Warfield and Voss. Now, if you're not familiar with Voss, Voss was really the father of modern biblical theology as we know it today, but unlike a lot of the biblical theology that pits scriptural studies and secondary sources and languages and and the narrative flow of the Bible against systematic theology, against creeds and confessions, that kind of nonsense, Voss wasn't like that. Voss was very classical. Voss had a view that was very creedal, very traditional, and, um, and so these are the guys that Machen learned from. Now, his favorite professor was a guy that's less of a household name, a guy by the name of Francis Patton. Don't be distracted by the picture on the right. Yes, we will get to that. Because Patton, in addition to being a great classical Christian philosopher, was also the president of the seminary. But that would change in 1902 when he was booted in favor of this guy. Yes, that is the same Woodrow Wilson that became the president of the United States. And so Princeton, the secular university, was beginning to flex its muscles and threaten what remained of the school that was once built by the Puritans. Now, Patton was allowed to remain and teach at sort of a detached seminary that was sort of off on the sides. You guys can keep doing spiritual, you know, subjective things over there in the corner while we turn this into a real university for the modern world. And it was in that academic year of 1905 and 06 that Machen would study abroad, first at Marburg in Germany and elsewhere. And there was one particular professor, um, as I've said this before, 
you know, Machen was well-grounded. He was not going to be uh, hoodwinked by a bunch of uh, evolutionary theory or by higher criticism or anything like that. But what really got him was this guy, Wilhelm Hermann, who, in addition to being a liberal, was a very grandfatherly, old, kind, you might even call him winsome. Remember that word? Winsome. And, um, and that shook Machen's faith. It wasn't any particular argument. It was this particular character trait. And, that, and, and he, he snapped out of it. But it would teach Machen a valuable lesson about the devil's working, that he can shake the mind through the heart and through the hands, and not only through the books and through the mind. And so it would teach Machen that very often hell's antidote to orthodoxy is not straightforward heresy, but sometimes winsomeness. And by the way, that would be a crucial part of liberalism. They would not just be matching doctrine with doctrine, orthodoxy with heresy, but we'd be matching doctrine as being important with life as what's really important. Relationship. Keep your antennas up there because that's been everywhere in the conservative church for the past 20, 30, 40 years. Okay, so you start to see some common threads here. Well, Machen uh, came home. He was offered positions at Lafayette College and Princeton. Of course, he chose the latter. Uh, he was a student favorite from the beginning. He was made New Testament associate professor during the 19-teens. And it was during those years that that modernist controversy really heated up. And during that time, a group of wealthy businessmen, brothers out in Southern California, Lyman and Milton Stewart, conceived to use their money for a little project. They would hire a sort of a dream team of conservative scholars to publish a two-volume set of answers and essays against the modern form of religion, and they would call it the fundamentals. And the fundamentals is where it's from that idea, from that title, that we get the word the fundamentalists or the fundamentalist movement. And that would be published throughout the years 1910 to 1915. Now, Machen was too young and unrecognized at this time to be asked to contribute, but Warfield was, and so that was one of the contributors to that volume. But before we get to the real heat of the controversy at Princeton, Machen goes to Europe again, this time for World War I. And he wouldn't fight, he would be, and he wouldn't even be a chaplain, but he would be in the service of the YMCA. Uh, he was a literary supplier to soldiers in the Allied side. And so he would give rest to the wounded, he would do things like that, all kinds of things. But um, it, it's interesting that at the end of it, and he'd write letters back and forth. To, I remember I mentioned his mother. His mother was like a sort of a sage uh, in the family. And she wrote an interesting letter to him toward the end of the war when it was obvious that he was safe, he was coming back home, it was over. And she wrote this. She said, I well know that you are in for a fight and that you will make enemies. That's an odd thing to say at the end of a war, right? But she understood that the battle with bullets was over and the real war that is really going on behind wars with bullets was about to begin, the war for the souls of men. Now, Machen was among those observing the funeral of B.B. Warfield, and he wrote to his mother, quote, it seems to me that the old Princeton, a great institution that it was, died when Dr. Warfield was carried out. Now, you know that when, well, people that know, know that. Uh, when you're in an institution and you realize from the beginning that it's not home turf, that you're not, you don't have allies on your side. Um, you did, and now that's sort of going away. The glory has left the building. And um, Machen would speak much with Warfield. They developed a friendship about the troubles in the Presbyterian church. They saw it going liberal, and of course, Princeton was... Uh, it was really a, a Presbyterian seminary. And so that meant that, that there's a reason why that is going liberal. It's, it's not an accident. And so you have all this stuff going on behind the scenes that the leaders are not admitting to their people. That's always the way it happens. It's happened that way in the SBC and other places down to the present day. And so Machen would write a series of books, and the first shot fired across enemy lines was a, was a book in 1921, two years earlier, The Origin of Paul's Religion. And I have to say, this is an incredibly dry book. I've read it. It's very dry. Um, so you have to be a nerd to read it or even care to read it. However, there is an importance in it because Machen's understanding at this time that the liberals' first 
line of attack is going to be not to say Jesus isn't God and all those things Paul said, that's not Scripture or Scripture's not inspired. Now, they will say that in the 1950s, but now they, they can't just get away with saying that out loud. So what they'll do instead is to, is to drive a wedge between Jesus and Paul. Did they even know each other? Did Paul even mention things? You, you hear this? You, you recognize this. That, that's a way of passively, aggressively saying what you want to say without saying what you want to say. He sort of, he sort of say what's at the tip of the wedge. And Machen understood that, and he wanted to argue against the thesis that, no, Paul was not the inventor of Christianity. Paul was getting this from Jesus just as Paul claimed. And there's all sorts of arguments you can make for that, and he was making that. But it was his broader critique that we're looking at two years later in 1923 called Christianity and Liberalism. And it won the acclaim of secular thinkers like Walter Lippmann who said, quote, this is an admirable book, a cool and stringent defense of orthodox Protestantism. Now, you ever notice that atheists in the modern world have much more respect for orthodox Christians than for liberals? If they're looking across enemy lines and they see liberals, speaking of World War I imagery, in no man's land, trying to seek some kind of middle ground, pretending to be Christian, being a scholar, being a, a seminary professor or a pastor, but not believing in supernature, not believing in the real deity of Christ, not believing in the inerrancy of Scripture, always apologizing for the Bible, always coming up with a natural explanation for a miracle or whatever it is. Atheists look at that and say, what are you even doing? Christians typically were sometimes too naive to see that. We want to be nice. We don't want to read motives. Atheists don't have that problem, and so they just look at liberals and say, they're, they're so pathetic. I want to say to liberals, why, first of all, why are liberals doing it? They want to seat at the cool kids' table. They want to impress all the wrong people. Well, guess what? Those people are not impressed by you. They look at you like a Benedict Arnold. They look at you like a Quisling, like a complete effeminate, not only traitor, but really a pathetic person that's sort of sucking up to uh, as I said, all the wrong people in society. But you're not going to get respect for that. Machen, though they disagreed with him and they disagreed with his worldview, they respected that he said what he meant and he meant what he said. So two events vaulted Machen into the thick of the fight. And the first one was on May 21st, 1922, when New York City's most renowned liberal preacher, a guy by the name of Harry Emerson Fosdick, preached a sermon called Shall the Fundamentalists Win? And of course, years later, he said, uh, well, I didn't mean to you know, start a fight over it. <laughs> I'm a liberal after all. But no, he totally meant to start a fight over it. People know what they're doing. And uh, he begins with the, the text of Acts 5, very sneaky, and how the Jews ignored the counsel of wise Gamaliel. And what he does is he positions the fundamentalists as if they're the stingy Jews. And the modernist Christians, the liberal Christians, as the flowering of a more expansive, more evolved faith. And so he says, quote, Jesus had not simply a historic, but a contemporary God, speaking now, working now, leading his people now from a partial into fuller truth. Jesus believed in the progressiveness of revelation. And these Jewish leaders did not understand that. Like them, today's fundamentalists insist that we must all believe in the historicity of certain special miracles, preeminently the virgin birth of our Lord, that we must believe in a special theory of inspiration, that the original documents of the Scripture, which of course we no longer possess, were inerrantly dictated to men a good deal as a man might dictate to a stenographer, that we must believe in a special theory of the atonement, that the blood of our Lord shed in the substitutionary death placates an alienated deity and makes possible welcome for the returning sinner. To which I respond, yeah, so? <laughs> a spe everything's special. A special theory of miracles. Yeah, like miracles. That, that's, that's, yes. A, a special theory of inerrancy. Yeah, that there's no errors. That there's not, that's not special. That's like what it means. And if you take that away, you take away the whole thing. A special theory of, of Jesus making it possible by His blood for sinners to come back to an alienated deity. Yeah? That's not special. That's the whole thing. 
How else are you going to get? How else? You, what are you going to do to impress a holy God? You see what they do, though? They make it into this special, particular theory of it, particular model. But you can't just put God in a box, can you? And so on and so on and so on, the winsome preacher went on to assure his audience that they were on the right side of history. There's another shot fired back at Machen in the form of Shaler Matthews of the University of Chicago Divinity School. He wrote a book called The Faith of Modernism in 1924, sort of his response to Machen. The Faith of a Modernist. And so uh, Machen fired right back at him in 1924 with a sequel called The Faith, or sorry, What is Faith? Uh, in, sorry, in 1925, the next year. And so Machen was very much on the radar screen now. He was the target. But a lot of that was really not where the big fight was happening. The big fight was happening in the Presbytery itself. It's supposed to be on your team. And at that time, it was the PCUSA. And so in 1920, and by the way, all those labels mean something different then than they do now. Um, so do keep that in mind. But in 1924 in Auburn, New York, enough signatories were persuaded by the liberals to reject an older resolution to enforce the strict meaning of the Westminster Confession. So in other words, they were subscriptionists. In other words, uh, if you want to be a minister in the Presbyterian Church, you have to actually believe what Presbyterians believe. And wow, that's, uh, that's crazy. But that's what they persuaded a bunch of the enough of the pastors who are assembled there to say that, wow, that really is crazy. I mean, where's the love in that? And so they rejected that. And so now you didn't have to subscribe to the confession. Well, by now, traps were laid in church and seminary for Machen. Enemies were hardened, and heretics among the faculty were sent to committees. There's just a shot of Princeton then, at least that part looking very much as it does now. But uh, heretics sent to committee chairs. That, you, that's not right. A heretic, the room you used to put heretics in was, well, you used to put them on the stand. They were on trial. Uh, but now they're, they're on the committees. Well, by 1926, the final net was spread. In one biography of Machen by Stephen Nichols, he explains, and this is a somewhat boring text. Uh, you, you might think, um, boy, that's uh, boring. Uh, the devil's in the details. That's where the devil gets you, where the places you're not interested in looking. Uh, that's how he shifts power in an institution. Here's what Nichols says. A strategy was employed to wrest control of the seminary from conservatives by a seemingly innocuous merging of the two boards of the seminary. From its charter, Princeton had been governed by a board of directors that oversaw the educational enterprise and a board of trustees largely tasked with financial issues. So stop right there. Conservatives, you handle doctrine. We don't want to be heretics, after all. Liberals, you handle the money. I got an idea. Why don't we not let liberals handle anything? Okay, that's step number one, but they didn't do that. So that's what they did up to that time. At the time of the 1920s, the makeup of the two boards happened to be a cluster of conservatives on the board of directors and liberals and moderates on the board of trustees. The merger would effectively shift power from a conservative base to a moderate and liberal one. So pretty boring, right? But how you understand the structure. It's like, what if you, uh, you, know, what if you merge the, 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 the House and the Senate? You say, ah, so what? They're just the uh, same people. Sure, but in one, you've got 100 representing, you see what I'm saying, a, a, a bigger slice of the pie. Over here, you've got like 430. If you merge them, you know, it's just 530 now. Yes, but the, the, the balance, the balance of power shifts, and they knew what they were doing, and just shake it up one day and say, uh, ah, look what happened, uh, there's more liberals here all of a sudden. No, it was intentional. So a total reorganization of the institution's polity was complete by 1929, and a smear campaign against Machen followed. His new name, at least in all the hate mail, was Professor of Bigotry. Professor of Bigotry. So uh, there's a little badge of honor there. Well, at the end of the school year, Machen was resolved to collect some friends who were still around to defend the Reformed faith and to start an institution of his own in Philadelphia. And it would be called Westminster Theological Seminary. Yeah, you can't, maybe you can't read that, but it gives the idea that if you were moving and shaking things in major church hierarchies, it made the papers, it made the New York Times. It was a very different world than the world that we live in right now. And of course, Machen was causing trouble. Machen proposes a new seminary, this, this new doctrine, 
uh, and, and so on, in quotes, continues old Princeton tradition. See, they knew how to use scare quotes back then, too, um, and so on. Uh, there's all these different things. Uh, Presbytery to try Machen as a rebel. Yes. Uh, so headlines. Uh, they weren't as good at lying back then, but, uh, or they had to be more careful about how they lied. Uh, but nevertheless, it was the same idea. So when he goes out there to Philadelphia, he, he, he founds a, a, a dream team faculty. It included the likes of John Murray, Ned Stonehouse, and a young Cornelius Van Til. And leaving Princeton as students and taking the first semester of classes, including men uh, who would shape post-war evangelicalism. A bunch of people who maybe, maybe their names are not as household, but they kind of hung out with Billy Graham and Carl F.H. Henry. Uh, if the name's J. Oliver Buswell or Harold J. Ockinga or Carl McIntyre mean anything to you, they, they were sort of the early students. I think, I think John Gerstner uh, studied under Van Til at Westminster um, before he went to Harvard. Um, maybe I'm just remembering things wrong, but I think that's true. I know he studied under Van Til. But anyway... Presbyterian Reform Publishing was created by that group in the same year, and uh, see, then all is well. Happy ending, right? Controversy over. Controversy is not over. It doesn't work like that. You know, you think, I'll start my own thing, and then we won't have to fight, but I'll be able to be uncompromising, and people will just leave me alone because, you know, the devil's got other things to do, right? No. No, it's not what happened. Uh, Machen wanted to deal with the problem of liberals corrupting the, the Board of Foreign Missions, and so in 1933, he created the Independent Board of Foreign Missions. Because then at least liberals would have an alternative and they would direct their funds to those who were actually preaching the gospel and uh, not just setting up humanitarian uh, efforts and uh, class trips and stuff like that. Well, that was the last straw for the liberals. Rockefeller money started pouring into the presbytery. Stop. Yes, I said that. Rockefeller, yes, the same John D. Rockefeller that now or ever since has funded the uh, People's Broadcasting, uh, or what do they call it? PBS, sorry. Uh, the PVS. Uh, so yes, the same Rockefeller, same Wilson, all those things. Again, it was a different world. And so some of the movers and shakers in society who wanted to destroy society and civilization knew that they had to destroy what remained of the church in order to do that. So you couldn't have this resurrection of the, the true church somewhere else. Uh, that, that's, that wasn't happening. And uh, what did they do? Well, all that money started to uh, create books published by the liberals, conferences held to attack the fundamentalist view of missions. And the main idea seemed to be that Christianity cannot be exclusive. It cannot possibly be the only way. And Machen responded that the liberal view was to send missionaries, quote, to seek the truth and not to present it. Well, that was definitely the last straw. They declared him to be a heretic, and anybody that cooperated with the mission board would be thrown away as a heretic and as a rebel. So in other words, you were a heretic if you were orthodox and a rebel if you wanted to stick to the confession. Well, he had a new idea. He would start a new church, a truly Presbyterian church. And the First General Assembly would meet on June 11th, 1936. Initially, it would be called the Presbyterian Church of America, ironically. But a year following Machen's death, the name would change to the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, or the OPC. By the end of the year, last point is a biography, against the advice of his friends, he boarded a train to North Dakota for speaking engagements, and he would die of pneumonia on New Year's Day. This is a picture I found of a uh, telegram. His last, as far as we know, his last communicated words, they were to John Murray, the fellow faculty member, and it says simply, so thankful for the act of obedience of Christ, stop, no hope without it, stop. Yeah, telegram language. But anyway, those were his last communicated words. So he died young and uh, accomplished a lot. And some former enemies showed insightful respect in newspaper obituaries. The author of The Good Earth, Pearl S. Buck, would write, quote, I was kicked out of the back door of the church, and he was kicked out of the front one. He retaliated by establishing a church of his own. And the arch skeptic, H.L. Mencken, uh, he was kind of the, the Christopher Hitchens of his day, uh, put it that way. But Mencken had compared Machen to a Matterhorn, a spiritual giant next to all of the spiritual midgets of liberal faith, concluding, quote, and this is an odd quote in the obituary, he failed, but he was undoubtedly right. Well, how did he fail if he was right? Well, that's the biography. Let me give a brief synopsis of the thesis of Christianity and liberalism and, and the structure of it, the form of it, 
just to introduce things. There's a big idea to Christianity. I like big ideas, if you haven't noticed. Uh, but if there was a big idea to Christianity and liberalism, Machen leaves us no doubt as to what it is. And the big idea is short and sweet, or it's short and utterly offensive, depending on who you are reading it, and it is this. Christianity and liberalism are two totally different worldviews. Or to say it another way, liberalism is not Christianity. Now, you look back at this and you say, so what? That's not, I mean, come on. That's not uh, too hard to say. We, we rec- Sure. But we look back on something that at the time, you have to realize all the churches that are sort of these stone really graveyards of spirituality in every inner city of our country. These very nice-looking churches that I'd like to have. I'd like to just possess those churches. There's no reason for those churches to not just be put into our, our hands and our property because they're not doing anything. No, it's like the radical feminist poetry society that meets there. There's nothing, there's no true faith going on there, but whether it's an Episcopal church or a Methodist church or something else, uh, it doesn't really matter. The point is, is that the place has been liberal for 100 years, and so you look at that and say, I can spot a liberal... When I see one, this is not controversial. Why are we even looking at this? Yeah, you can spot one in a history book. It's kind of like the heroes of the faith, too. We all idolize Luther and Augustine and Spurgeon. Sure we do, from afar. But they're kind of like a lion at the zoo. They're cool to look at when there's bars in between us, bars of time. But if they were there, actually messing up things in your church, you, you might be tempted to be scandalized by the actual historical figure. It's the same thing with liberal, liberalism. These churches were the big seeker-friendly churches. These were the family-friendly churches. These were the churches that had the T-shirt, the mug, the bumper sticker. Um, their pews were full. They, they were where life was in the 19th century. And so if you came around even in the 1920s and said, that's not Christianity, that would be like saying that to evangelicals as a whole right now. That's how that would play. That's how you would sound. This was a monster we can look back at him and say, well, we all agree with Machen now. We can all see what liberalism was. To the degree that we think like that, no, we can't. Because the essence of it is something that's always there. It's always being repackaged. And only the outer packaging is what changes. But that's the thesis. Christianity and liberalism are two totally different worldviews. Now, in order to argue that, he has to argue kind of a sub-thesis to that. Because he understands what liberalism is trying to do. As I said, liberalism is not going to meet you head on and say, oh yeah, Jesus was not God. They're not going to say that right away. They're going to come in, they're going to creep in, as Jude said. And so as a corollary to this thesis, Machen was forced to argue that Christianity is primarily a doctrine and only secondarily a way of life or, say it another way, Christianity as a way of life is only as good as its doctrine. Now, that might shock us today. And that's another reason I'm bringing that second point up. Because there, I think, we'll start to see the point of the wedge in our own day. Pay special attention to the uses of the word primarily and secondarily. Machen is not arguing that there's any part of the Christian consciousness that could ever be doctrinal but not experiential. All we need is doctrine. We don't need life and relationship. He's not saying that. But what he was arguing for was a logical order, a prioritizing. He saw that the whole genius of the liberal was to beguile the weak-minded feeler into expecting an experiential, not doctrinal alternative. Life, better a, what is it, better a, a live heresy than a, than a dead orthodoxy. You ever hear that? That's dumb. How about a a live orthodoxy, I'm thinking. Okay, so Machen wasn't saying, now I'll just go on the flip side of that and say, all I need is doctrine, not life. No, but he was, he saw the liberal painting the church into this corner that all that matters is relationship. And from there, from that corner, all doctrine would be denied. This was a winsome wedge to morph even the most essential doctrines bit by bit. Well, the book has seven chapters, and starting next week, we'll look at two doctrines, because introduction is, is just that. We'll look at a couple quotes here in closing. But 
doctrine, God of man. So you can see it kind of flows like, hey, here's some basic areas of the Christian faith. I just made the claim liberalism is not the same thing as Christianity. Let me show that to you in the biggest areas. And I'll show you that what they're doing erodes the whole thing, takes back the whole thing. Liberalism was neither more spiritual nor more scientific than Orthodox faith. And liberal faith was coming in and saying that we are that progressive as, as, as that sermon by Henry Emerson Fosdick was claiming. We're the more progressive, the more relational. So in other words, we're the more spiritual, the more scientific. It makes an impressive show of that. Now the introduction explains what's at stake and it gives a fascinating hint about the sort of people that we're up against that we would contend for the truth up against. Now, let me inject a quote by R.C. Sproul, which I think gets to the heart of what Machen is getting at in the introduction. Then we'll bring some Machen quotes in. But Sproul once spoke of what he called studied ambiguity. Studied ambiguity, which I think is very illuminating to the sort of people that Machen had to do business with. When I brought this up the first time, uh, the Hobbit movies were all out, you know, we'd freshen our memories and so on. And I don't even remember which one it was, but there was a famous scene, and these are the days when you used Lord of the Rings imagery in every sermon. <laughs> it's all young guys anyway and stuff. Anyway, so this is one scene, the table at Rivendell, where uh, Gandalf is speaking sort of telepathically with the other, I can't remember, the, Galadriel, the, the, the lady in the woods person, I don't remember their names anymore, and then the, uh, and the wizard, of course, um, Saruman. And... Um, and they were communicating with each other secretly, do you know that he's turned yet? And so they were, they, he's turned. And, but there was this other wizard that he was sort of talking down to, and he wasn't arguing that evil is really the good side. He wasn't arguing that the orcs are right, or that we should all worship whatever that eye is. I can't remember anything now anymore. Sauron, right. He, that, that wasn't the argument. He wasn't just coming out. Instead, he speaks to Gandalf and to this other wizard by saying, let's talk about what we know. There's no more evil in the world like that. All, all that stuff's been taken care of. You see, what is he doing? As, when I saw that in the movie theater, I jumped out of my seat and I said, that's that pastor I just talked to in the coffee shop. That's that, <laughs> that's that guy that wrote the book against Machen, Shaler Matthews. That's how they argue. Okay, so, so what is studied ambiguity? Sproul says this, This is an intentional ambiguity by which words and phrases are left blurry enough for antithetical views to be safely held by both sides in a debate. Church history testifies that the studied ambiguity is the refuge of the heretic. If he can blur his meaning, he can safely continue to slither along on his belly. By the way, this is why all heretics, all the time, no exception, make arguments like this. Show me that word in the Bible. All of a sudden, they care about the Bible. Trinity, that word's not in the Bible. No, show me the exact words in the Bible. Show me where Paul says imputation. But those were just the additional philosophical words by these early church fathers that were so enmeshed in Greek philosophy and so on. So now the heretic wants to be a purist, and he cares about words. Calvin talks about this in the Institutes as well, that this is a refuge for the heretic. What do those words like Trinity do? They clarify. Because wolves are more active at the edge of the sheep pen, shepherds have to post more language, and that language is inevitably extra-biblical. Well, what do they do? They summarize, they clarify, they're like the confession. It's why the liberal didn't want to subscribe to the confession. He doesn't want lights on in the room. And so Sproul is saying that, when you have this mushy middle about relationship, what do you do? You just change the subject from the truth and the falsity of the situation. Now, Machen was no stranger to this. He says this, Presenting an issue sharply is indeed by no means popular business at the present time. There are many who prefer to fight their intellectual battles in what Dr. Francis L. Patton has aptly called a condition of low visibility. Clear-cut definition of terms in religious matters, bold facing of the logical implications of religious views, is by many persons regarded as an impious proceeding. Oh, just this week, Wikipedia 
changed their definition of the word recession. Well, because the White House did. Got to keep up with the times. It then proceeded, supposedly, by pictures on memes. Could have been photoshopped. I looked into it. I was, it was kind of iffy, but I wouldn't doubt it. Changed their definition of the word definition. Now, in the old Soviet dictionary, the definition of peace is the conditions that things exist under socialism. The definition of justice is the condition that things exist under socialism. Why do church leaders downplay doctrine? Well, it's because they're nice guys. No, it's not. It's because they're trying to get away with something. It's the same reason someone who's doing evil things would not want lights on in a room, wouldn't want his words on record, and so forth. So the agent of evil has to turn down his heresy to a simmer when he sees light coming on into the room. And doctrinal clarity and words are light going up and on in a room. So what manner of darkness was modern liberalism trying to push in this ambiguous Manner. Well, it begins with the name itself, as Machen explains. He says, quote, This modern non-redemptive religion is called modernism or liberalism, but both names are unsatisfactory. The latter, liberalism, in particular is question-begging. The movement designated as liberalism is regarded as liberal only by its friends. To its opponents, it seems to involve a narrow ignoring of many relevant facts. The many varieties of modern re liberal religion are rooted in naturalism, that is, in the denial of any entrance of the creative power of God, as distinguished from the ordinary course of nature, in connection with the origin of Christianity, end quote. So why, let, let's call our name something like happy. By the way, go on the, uh, I think it's, a, I don't know if it's the WEF or whatever, but they, they call the name of their economic system. This is not a joke. It's not satire. It's called happyism or happytillism. That's right, happytillism. These are the guys that say you will own nothing and be happy. It's a great name because it's happy. Happy to -lism. liberalism. What do you think of when you think of liberalism? You, you think of liberating, freedom, wide open spaces to commit heresy. I mean, to, to be happy. And so all the emphasis is on a subjective feeling and, and an inevitable progress. Modern, new. People who start sentences with, we now know. When we now know something, we don't know it. We totally don't know it. We're just using language to hide behind um, to avoid an argument about something that totally ought to be debated. So liberalism is not particularly liberal so much as it's anti-supernatural. That is its chief characteristic, anti-supernaturalism. Whatever might be modern about it, everything good in the modern West comes directly from the Christian worldview. In other words, a spiritual worldview. If you look at the world around you, sociologists call this a plausibility structure. There's stuff around me, and that stuff around me convinces me that I live in such and such a kind of world. There are arguments, in fact, there are so-called scholars that will make arguments. For example, the New Testament scholar Rudolf Bultmann in the middle of the 20th century made the argument that we can't take seriously the supernatural view that comes through the Bible anymore. Why? Because we're about to put a man on the moon. We've got toasters and stuff, for crying out loud. That's your argument? Toasters trump God? Um, that is their argument. However much they may wrap it up and, and, and twist it into different things, that's the argument. And you hear it again and again and again in different ways. But what Machen is saying that everything you're calling modern, everything that was good in the Enlightenment, was hijacked by the secularists in the Enlightenment. They came from Christianity, whether it's the scientific revolution, of which all of its progenitors were all Bible-believing Christians. There's exceptions. Newton denied the Trinity. We get it. But if you look at all those different things, those come from a biblical worldview, they come from a spiritual worldview. Things that change in the natural world that are reshaped are reshaped by what? Not by blind natural forces, but by spiritual superior truth. So Machen says, but such changes in the material condition of life do not stand alone. They've been produced by mighty changes in the human mind, as in their turn they themselves give rise to further spiritual changes. The industrial world of today has been produced not by the blind forces of nature, but by the conscious activity of the human mind. So when you see things good in the modern world that are better, thank a Christian, is what Machen's saying. 
Um, th- those things go back to the presuppositions of a Christian worldview, not to a secular worldview. In light of the supposed triumph of naturalistic science over supernatural religion, he says the liberal theologian seeks to rescue certain of the general principles of religion. In other words, the liberal is embarrassed by this book that was written by ancient nomads and has these miracles, and he's trying to save Jesus from things that he obviously didn't know. Well, he wouldn't say it like that, but that's what he's saying. Machen's point is this. That liberalism fails on both scores. Number one, on the ground that it is unchristian, and two, on the ground that it is unscientific. And far from being liberal in the great task of the church, liberalism joins forces with the statist, the enslaver, and especially in school. Machen had a lot to say about education, which is very interesting. For example, he says this, in the, this is in the introduction of this book. He says, quote, "...freedom of thought in the Middle Ages was combated by the Inquisition." But the modern method is far more effective. Place the lives of children in the formative years, despite the conviction of their parents, under the intimate control of experts appointed by the state. Force them then to attend schools where the higher aspirations of humanity are crushed out and where the mind is filled with the materialism of the day and it is difficult to see how even the remnants of liberty can subsist. So here's what Machen said, just to wrap it up. Liberals join with the naturalists, who are the statists, and what they want to do is crush the very liberal arts education and all thinking that created Western civilization. And they will do it with the help of the church, with the help of the limp-wristed liberal leader of the church. The church will do its own job in creating a class of less intelligent lay people who don't know doctrine and don't know that this is happening to them. And so in summary of the basic thesis, last quote, he says this, Despite the liberal use of traditional phraseology, modern liberalism not only is a different religion than Christianity, but belongs in a totally different class of religions. And this matters for everything practical. He says, If a condition could be conceived in which all the preaching of the church should be controlled by the liberalism, which in many quarters has already become preponderant, then we believe Christianity would at last have perished from the earth and the gospel would have sounded forth for the last time. Now, if you haven't caught it, those are fighting words, and that stays throughout the book. So let me open it up to questions or comments or anything else. I know there was a lot of biographical and somewhat lecture material this time, but when we get into chapter, when we get into the chapters, we'll start to get more of it into a theological comparison. But any, any questions? Yes. Well, touched on it briefly, but you didn't mention in the 20s, uh, 1925, the uh, Scopes Monk yeah. trial, which was a big, big event yeah. in American culture, mm-hmm. uh, which also focused also on this, besides evolution, the whole uh, beginnings of science right. being coming to save us yeah. from, uh, instead of belief in God. Right. Yeah, so for a lot of people, the most famous aspect of the modernist or fundamentalist controversy was the Scopes trial. And partly because they do come from a, a, a worldview, I was going to say scientific, but I wouldn't want to dignify the, the, the materialist worldview, but there's another word for this, scientism. Um, in the 19th century, that view of science that became hijacked and separated from its philosophical foundations now had science as the highest court of appeals, and really the only court of appeals when it came to what is objectively true. But then, as you said, that translates into into ethics. How do we make this world a better place? Well, it has to be a scientific question. And so um, even when you talk about literary criticism, the word scientific would be used as an adjective to describe um, a, a more scientific way of reading the Bible, taking into account this and this and that. That word was, was something that intellectuals craved. You even see it in the history of psychology. They weren't respected at first, and they wanted a more scientific discipline. And so they made that more materialistic. And uh, so that, yes, that was the, uh, very much at the core of it. And, and again, looking back on it, I think we can see that liberalism is defined by its anti-supernaturalism, its materialism. And then you trace it out and you realize, okay, everything they say then about Scripture, 
about the church, about Jesus, about miracles. Uh, it just comes from the same, the same common thread is there, anti-supernaturalism. It has zero to do with actual relationship, actual love, all the stuff that they put at the front for the lay people. At, underneath it, and that's what Machen was doing. He was doing the dirty work of exposing what's back there, and you, you don't do that. That's, that's naughty. The, uh, you know, today, the, the Baptist has what's called a, an 11th commandment, the Southern Baptist. There's an 11th commandment. Thou shalt not speak evil of another Southern Baptist. And I think it's not just them. I think they just state it out loud. I think Christians in general have that idea um, of, uh, you know, don't say that there might be ulterior motives here or, you know, anything like that. It just feels dirty, like we're elevating ourselves above them. And we fall for it, and we don't do the, the hard work that Machen did. All right. Well, let me, let me pray to wrap up. Our Father, we thank you for this day. We pray for your blessing on the whole church service today. We pray for your blessing on this study as we walk forward in the weeks to come through this book, that it would be profitable to us. Um, and we thank you and, and give you praise for this. In Jesus' name, amen.